I'm so happy to be um, here with you. I'm glad they invited me to interview you. Thank you. Um, if you don't know, Nick is a very interesting guy. Um, first, you are the co-owner of one of Chicago's hottest restaurants, Alinea, which is um, not just sort of award-winning, but I think considered one of the best restaurants in the world consistently, consistently by people uh, in the know. Uh, you own a number of other restaurants, St. Clair Supper Club, Aviary, Next, which also is award-winning. Um, but in addition to that, you have a software company, Talk, that you started in 2014. Um, and Talk, in my understanding, is basically you've enabled restaurants to sort of deal more directly with their um, patrons. They're offering restaurants yeah. directly. Yeah. Uh, they can sort of customize offerings, which is really nice. Um, so I thought to start, one thing that I thought was sort of funny is you're Greek American or half Greek American, I'm Greek American. Um, and a lot of us sort of, there's like restaurants run in our blood. Like my grandparents had restaurants. I know your father had a diner in Chicago yeah. uh, before you were born. But you didn't jump into restaurants right away. No, no, I had the usual where I started a derivatives trading firm right out of college because I was a philosophy major. That's really important. <laughs> um, then did that for 11 years, uh, built that to about 100 employees, um, and we're doing about 4% of the daily volume of the Amex in ETFs in 99, 2000, 2001. Um, and then I met Grant Ackett, the chef, um, who if uh, you, know, you wanna learn more about him, uh, Netflix, Chef's Table, season two, uh, spinning plates. There's, he had tongue cancer and a very incredible outcome. Um, he's still 10 years cancer free. Um, but I met him when he was very young and he was the same kind of person that I would want to hire in my trading firm. Um, and it was more just like Josh Koppelman was talking about. It was about backing a great person. Um, I knew nothing about the restaurant business, but I did know that in Chicago, if you turn 40 and you don't own a restaurant, they give you a <laughs> hot dog joint on the west side for free. Um, that's true. And so I didn't want to do that, so I had to build a lineage. So you, you and your wife had like a standing date at this restaurant where Grant was the chef. Yes. And you basically said, if you want to do something on your own, look me up. Yeah, I mean, in 2005, this is a little bit pre-blogging and pre-foodie a little bit, um, you could be surprised going into a restaurant. And what Grant was doing was what I think we all try to do anytime we build anything. He was doing something that was emotionally resonant with consumers. So you would go in there and you'd have this incredible experience and every day from the time we're babies, we kind of do this. Like we, people shovel food into our mouths. And all of a sudden that was broken apart by design, experience, the type of food, things that you didn't even know by looking at them what they were, but then when you tasted them, they were comfortable and delicious. And I felt like I knew how to build businesses. I started investing in the internet in 1996. And I just said to him one day, like, if you ever want to do something more than this, let me know. And he said, well, what kind of restaurant do you want to build? And I said, how should I know? I've never built a restaurant before, but I want to make it great. And so I knew nothing about it. Um, a year to the day later of that conversation, we opened Alinea. Um, and I remember on the first day, I thought I was done. It was kind of like a, a film production where you, you produce the film and then people can watch it. But of course, with a restaurant, you're making art every day that people consume. It's one of the only art forms or forms of entertainment um, that's consumable. It's more like a theater. And so uh, I remember he just grabbed me by the tie. I don't wear one often, but I did on opening night. And he grabbed me and, and just said, you know, go over to table 40 and make sure that they're doing it the right way. Um, so 16 years later, I have six restaurants um, and about 300 employees um, between Chicago and New York. And um, what I learned when I actually started running the restaurant when, when Grant got sick was that no one else knew anything about running a restaurant either. Um, it's one of those areas where tradition exceeds expertise. Um, and the software for it was built in a way that looked like 1998 still. So in 2005, uh, an open table salesman would come literally with a briefcase and, and the ERB and say, look at this bad boy, I can leave it here for you today. And that's kind of what they still do. And I came from a trading organization and company that was built for real scale. So we could process hundreds and thousands of transactions 
even back in 1999, before trading, um, before there was high frequency trading and whatnot, we could process hundreds of thousands of transactions a day without a problem. I couldn't even know who my customers were in 2010. That was held from me. And so whenever I see opaque information, as an arbitrageur, I want to run to that opaqueness and opacity, I guess. And um, that's what I did, and we started to talk. So, so that was, because you know, I think a lot of people think, oh gosh, you know, restaurant reservation software, like why do we need another one of these? There's so many of them. Sure. Um, although a lot have come and gone, a lot have been acquired. Um, you're saying that OpenTable kept all the customer information, and so that was your sort of starting point. This was a need you wanted to sort of better connect with them. Yeah, so I mean, was everything that Josh was talking about with CRM and all of those tools that he uses to keep track of his conversations, I, we were doing on, on a spreadsheet mm -hmm. um, with, if you dined with us, or if any of you have dined with us, I could look up every single thing that you've eaten, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you left on the table, what your wife or spouse likes to drink. Um, and we were doing that in a very rote way, and we couldn't share that information with our other restaurants. If we open a second restaurant, you've been to one restaurant 20 times, I couldn't, they were siloed on purpose because mm -hmm. of the business model of, 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 of OpenTable and Booking.com. So when I started it, I started building it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Danny Meyer told me, you'll never sell a ticket to a restaurant. I thought of it 20 years ago, it won't work. Um, we process about $2 million a day now, um, and prepaid tickets. But at the time, I built myself, by myself with one programmer, um, a very rudimentary system, and we sold $562,000 of tickets in the first day. What, what is a ticket? Well, so there's three kinds of reservations that you make in the world of any, of in, in anything. There's free reservations, like ordinary reservations. Mm -hmm. There's times where you have to make put a deposit down on something, and there's times that you prepay something. If you think about it, if you were coming to the Rose Bowl, and you're going to buy a ticket to the Rose Bowl and see a game and suddenly your dog gets sick and you've got to go to the vet, you do not call the Rose Bowl and say, I'm really sorry, I can't make it tonight, give me my money back. They play the game without you. Um, with restaurants where demand exceeds supply by two or three X to one, there's an opportunity to charge like a movie or a concert or anything else. It's a form of entertainment. And that's what was going through my head because we were running 8% no-show rates. We had $600,000 of, of labor answering a phone every day, disappointing people, telling people no. So they would call and say, I want 7 o'clock on a Saturday. So we started tracking what everything that they wanted, what their request, requests were, and 85% of the requests are the same. And yet, it's like walking into a sweater store or something, and you have no sweaters, and you have to go, do you have a, a black cardigan? Nope, try again. You know, it's like the, the information is still like that with most systems. and so. I didn't really realize how big of a problem it was. I just knew that I needed to solve my own problem. And now we've got 100 employees building all sorts of different iterations of dynamic and variable pricing for time-slotted businesses. So your dentist should cost less on Tuesday. Flat out, it will in the future. Um, we all know, I think everyone here looks at things like that and goes, well, in 10 years for sure, pricing will be differentiated in real time, and yet, in restaurants, it's 4% of GDP. Sit-down restaurants are 4% of GDP. And all you do now is, like, Google's building a thing to call the restaurant. I don't want to have a robo call that, that is not tied to my inventory. It's a terrible customer experience. I fought like heck to get them to stop doing that with my restaurants. And yet I want to integrate with them in a way that's positive for the consumer. So you're selling experiences that are sort of dynamically priced based on when the person's going to come in. So you've got somebody who really wants to come in on a Tuesday, Saturday night, but you're like, look, if you come in um, on a Tuesday night, yeah, we're going to... Yeah, it should cost less. Okay. Um, it's just like good seats and bad seats. I'm sure the seats on the 50-yard line cost more than the nosebleeds. And is this a deposit, or is this the... Uh... Everything. Okay. It depends. So for my restaurants, for Alinea, we're sold out every night, 360 nights a year. Um, for our bar, the aviary, we charge a $5 deposit. Um, the loss aversion, I don't care what your socioeconomic status is, if you put $5 down as a commitment, you will be way more likely, about five times more likely to show up. It's, um, it's, it's Richard Thaler, the behavioral economist, saw that I was doing this and I wrote a paper about it. And he called me up one day and he was like, I want to write about this because you put all your data out and it's what I've been trying to prove. Um, and he's a good friend and he's on our board now. And those are the kinds of questions that we ask as we're trying to build these things out. 
Well, that's something that a competitor of yours who was acquired last year, Resi, acquired by American Express, had done too. I think they charged like $5 deposits, and they said the no-shows had gone to like 5%. They actually didn't charge them, though. Oh, oh, they what they did is they held the credit card, which is a very different thing, because then it feels like a penalty afterwards if you don't show up. It is a slight difference from like a build-it thing, but the outcome is very, very, very different. That's interesting. Um, when people prepay, it runs like a 0.38% no-show rate. 0.38%. It's indistinguishable. When people put down a, even a $5 deposit, it's 3%. When you take a credit card but don't charge them until afterwards, it's about 9%, but they then do chargebacks. So if you try to charge a $75 penalty to go to a restaurant in San Francisco, people complain about it. It feels like a penalty. Or they want a gift certificate, which just simply moves their economic loss out a month or two. There's so much psychology that goes into this stuff. Yes. I mean, um, you and I were even talking briefly ahead of um, today about tipping. And you were saying you think that tipping oh, should boy. be done Tipping's with. a 30-minute thing in and of itself. Right, right, right. Um, I can't even begin to go into tipping, other than we eliminated tipping 10 years ago successfully. The Fair Labor Standards Act is completely broken for restaurants over a $35 check average. Um, and in, in New York, um, there is case law that prevents it from being easy to do. But as minimum wage goes to $15 an hour in states like California and, and um, Washington State and whatnot, uh, you'll see tipping going away more and more and more. And that's a good thing for the employees. It's, that's what people don't understand. It's actually great for the employees to have a 401k, health care, all of that, and to be treated like the professionals that, like, if I wanted to hire you, we could come to an arrangement, a uh, salary and a bonus, and that's perfectly legal because you are a professional. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a whole different ball of wax. It's a, well, I, I bring it up because I think it's, again, going back to psychology, from what I've read, um, sort of higher end restaurants like your own can get away with it. it beyond a certain point, um, people sort of see it as the restaurant's sort of trying to get away with something. They feel like the service is going to be substandard. And I also wonder if selling tickets to a restaurant is also only, or to other verticals, if you're getting into other verticals, is only sort of applicable um, when you're paying above a certain so, price point. Absolutely true. But let's say you have a great mom and pop restaurant, mm -hmm. and then normally they just are free reservations and you go in. All of a sudden what happens is on Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve, all of that, they actually can sell a ticket. Um, and they do already, they use Eventbrite for it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanna really make a, a, a platform and a commerce platform for restaurants, you have to have the CRM that we talked about, you have to have the ability to have those three kinds of reservations and those special events built in. And it's taken us like five years to build that all out. And getting to the, to the title of the talk, you know, there's a choice that you make when you first start building a company about which thing you're gonna scale. Mm -hmm. Like, Resi gave away their product for free, or very, very, very cheaply, to restaurants in Los Angeles and New York. Um, Reserve did the same thing. And I was sitting in Chicago going, I'm in Chicago, I like to make money. Everything I ever do makes money. Let's charge people, we'll provide a real ROI. But then what'll happen is we will get the scale if the French Laundry signs up and uses our product because it's great and it's at that level and high end, we'll get a quarter million new users a year for free instead of trying to pay 20, someone $20 to download my app with a coupon. And that's what's happened. We've gotten to 11 million um, users. We had about a quarter million a month. Um, and we are in a really fortunate position that you, know, you get that, that engineering saying it's either great, fast, or cheap, pick two. Um, we kind of just picked great early on and didn't really worry about the scale because early on, if you go from one to two, you're not logarithmic, you just added a client. Um, you can't know for, for a period of time if you're, capital, um, if you're capital efficient whether or not you can scale. So what I heard from a lot of investors early on was spend $20 million to get a, a consumer network. And I thought we could build that network without spending anything. And that's what we've done. And so how are you, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of it is word of mouth in terms of garnering more customers. What is that sales process like, though? Are they, is it, do, do they see it as a big gamble? Do they say, all right, we'll try this for, like... Well, okay. anytime you're ripping or replacing a system that's mm -hmm. been around for 20 or 30 years, um, you have some convincing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the crossing the chasm thing is real. Like, the first, you know, couple of years, we would add, you know, 15, 20 restaurants a month, and they would be we had to learn really quickly, they were either really great and mm -hmm. had high, high demand, 
or they were failing and willing to try anything. So you had to really learn to pick your, the right customers mm -hmm. when you were early in the process. Now what's happening is that we built out a system that is cloud-based with the only independent system left, and we built it for enterprise. So we have 400 API endpoints, we can integrate with Salesforce, but we can also do specialty integrations with, with you know, Vail Resorts is a client of ours now. Um, so all of that now is going laterally, we're getting the halo effect. Um, we spend very, very, very little on marketing to, um, to businesses. Um, we spend an awful lot of money now and, and we're building out that consumer network. And we are about to announce in a week that the largest bank in America, we will be their dining program. But the cool part about that news is that every single one of those people in the largest rewards program in, in the country is going to get a TAC account. So that's how I get 30 million U.S. households all at once. That's incredible. Okay, backing up really quickly. So this is a SaaS product. They're paying monthly, and then there's like tiered offerings. Yes, yes. And can we talk about the bank? Can we just announce this? I can't. I, I already did, and you could figure it out, but yeah. don't get mad at me. We're friend uh, eight here, right? Like this. <laughs> well, you told me, so I wasn't sure if I could yeah. relate this. But it is uh, sort of, it does sort of reflect what happened to Resi, which was bought by American Express last year. And so American Express now is offering Resi um, as a way to sort of uh, create a path for their customers, their platinum customers, to book uh, restaurant reservations. Will this look much different than that, or how will you sort of? Boy, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we're building out several initiatives with them and on our own for consumer products that are as differentiated for the consumer. Um, I'll say, like, one of the things that we're working on is instead of a wait list, a wish list. Um, the wishes are more hopeful. It's, it's a digital concierge that it's completely silly to have somebody in Toronto. If you call a credit card company, I won't name the name, and you call a credit card company and you say, I am a XYZ card holder and I want to get a restaurant, a reservation at Alinea, there is a company in Toronto that has a whiteboard, I've been there and seen it, with my phone number on it and they try to call me. That is not scalable. Um, it's not going to work. And so what we're doing is we're building um, a la a trading firm, we know exactly when restaurants put reservations up, whether they're on our platform or not. We can instantaneously in milliseconds grab and hold the table for 24 hours, email you the customers, and uh, provide a whole bunch of different sales add-ons. It's really like we sell a million or two million dollars worth of books for restaurants on checkout. Like the exit path is through the gift shop now, but in a way that's on your phone when you're in pajamas at two in the morning. So I guess in what other ways are you using the data that you're collecting from your um, customers? That's a, yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the most important pieces of data within a restaurant group that we don't share across mm -hmm. is that we want to know your preferences, uh, um, dietary preferences, restrictions, your, your, your spouse's birthday, all of those things. Um, those are for better hospitality. Um, now what the next step is that we want you to give us that information. We already know your dining history. Why is there no platform like Spotify or Netflix for restaurants that anticipates your need, knows what you enjoy, and suggests little nudges to you going, hey, um, your anniversary is coming up in a little while. Maybe you should book this now. Uh, and we've got these great five choices that are in your thing. So that, that mass personalization for the consumer is, is coming. That's something that we're building. And um, you know you have to get to a point where you have enough of that data mm -hmm. to uh, to do it well enough that it's meaningful. But uh, we're there now. It's the restaurant industry is brutally competitive, though. Are there concerns from your some of your customers that maybe don't want to be in that sort of rotation, or is it sort of like either we don't know. Yeah. We haven't done it yet. Um, you know, restaurants are incredibly uh, myopic in the sense that I don't care how good you are they are concerned that when I turn on bookings for March, I hope we have customers. It's a really weird business that way. Um, and what we're going to be able to do is that because of, of some of the data and people indicating interest before the reservations are available, we get to show the restaurant an elasticity of their demand before they actually put those bookings on. That's incredibly powerful because yeah. now for the first time they can know they can project out months into the future what their demand will look like.
And you're working with restaurants and also wineries. I'm just wondering what the vision is, if they're, you're going to be getting into sort of other verticals or hospitality is kind you of... You know, we've, we've experimented with, with other verticals. We're focused on hospitality. It's a huge... We're in 30 countries organically already. Um, and so it's a huge, huge, huge space. Um, but, you know, it's, if, if, I was, if I was left to my own devices and didn't have people managing me, I'd already have Dennis using it. So, um, you know, there's spas, dentists. What's, oh, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's universally applicable. It's exactly what I used to do as a trader. Um, it's just in a different marketplace. Right, right, right. And the, the thing that people don't understand or don't think about is that if there are people no-showing a restaurant reservation, that means food is going to waste. So my margins increase from 10 to 20% across, you know, a $70 million a year revenue stream. That's a massive difference for me, but it, the reason I'm making more money is because there's less food waste. That's better for the environment. It's better for your staff. It's, it has so many, um, it touches our lives in so many different ways, mm -hmm. and it's an emotionally resonant product. Just like Grant's food is emotionally resonant, eating out is one of those things we do for entertainment. It's the only thing where you actually put something in your mouth, or almost the only thing. Um, and that's really personal. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's what we always consider as we're building our software. Is we're always going, how can we make that as emotionally resonant on the consumer side, but also for our our clients who are the restaurants? What can we do for them to get them to run their businesses better and easier and faster, but keep their own identity? So we, you will not see a lot of talk branding um, around. What you see is is the restaurant's image. It's white label. Yeah. I think that's great, and it's so important now because I feel like there's so many headwinds uh, that restaurants are facing, specifically ghost kitchens. Uh, I don't know if this is something that you are concerned by as a restaurateur. I think it's impacting sort of. Um, I gotta tell you, if you could build a ghost models. kitchen that does what we do, God bless you. Like there's just, again, it's it's about emo Like if I want to eat fast on a Tuesday night, and someone could build a better. There's no storefront, and I can get it delivered from a delivery service, and it's great food. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I don't think us sitting down together, having a glass of wine and chatting, I think that's actually on the upswing, because we're so, we're so removed from each other in every other aspect of our lives that dining is so culturally significant. You know, if I just say the word Italy or Japan, one of the first things you think about is the food of that country, and that's really ingrained in us. And, as, as humans, you know? I think you're absolutely right. That, well, certainly that it's more important than ever and it's sort of more kind of treasured, I think, than ever by people because there are fewer points of contact. Yeah. Um, you know, interestingly, this terrible thing happened in San Francisco. I don't know if you followed it. I don't know if uh, folks in the audience uh, are aware, but um, there was sort of a kerfuffle, maybe, maybe more than that, this past weekend. Um, some uh, fine dining establishments realized that uh, Yelp and uh, Grubhub and some other um, delivery services were selling food that was ostensibly from the restaurants, yes. but may have been sort of like food fraud made at but a there's, ghost kitchen somewhere else. There's a sales tactic going on with a lot of different companies now, not just the delivery services, but even Yelp or Facebook or whatnot, where they are creating template business pages and then sending you orders that say, and then saying, look, we, we have demand that mm -hmm, you, could, mm -hmm. you, know, you, could be, you could be selling this right now. We had people show up at Royster where we do not do any carry out saying, hey, where's my carry out? It's been like an hour. Um, oddly, Matt, Matt Maloney is on our board, who's the CEO of Grubhub. Oh, really? So I called him up directly <laughs> that's great. and said, that's really uncool. Um, yeah, it's a terrible practice. Um, I know Pim, who wrote the, the Twitter feed that kind of went viral. Um, she's great. Uh, I don't think that's good practice for any kind of business. Um, it's certainly something that one of our competitors did. Um, my restaurant has an open table page. Why? While well, they're trying to suck, say, this restaurant's not an open table, but these five others are, let's siphon off the business. I see. And that's how they get paid. So we didn't set up our, our business that way. We don't. We don't uh, make money that way. But you have to be really vigilant as a restaurateur to sort of make sure. I, I have a, a reputation of being very vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, 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 <laughs> um, I was a little mean to them um, when that happened. Um, that said, you know, I, I do get, um, 
I do get the temptation to do those things. I just think that's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time, but I did want to ask you, since we do have investors in the audience and probably foodies, um, you've raised something like 17 million so far? 17 million. So, but you also struck this deal with this credit card company that we are forbidden from naming yet. Um, are you looking for more funding or are you? I, as I tell people, we're in the very fortunate position where we don't need it right now. Mm -hmm. We are also in an inflection point where we, with the launches of these two products that we have that we could grow more quickly, we're the only independent left. So we have entertained some, some offers to accelerate things. I'm, I'm a former trader, so it's always uh, um, something, something between zero and a lot. And we will, uh, we will see how it goes. And I'm always willing to have the conversation. That's great. Nick, such a treat to meet you. Awesome, Connie. Thank you. Scotty Sopoli. <laughs> the only Greek I know. <laughs>